been doing the Beloved in Christ many years ago. Um, I, when I was in the seminary, I went with my brother to, to get his uh, driver's license, and he took the driving test, and everything was fine, and then he filled out the paperwork, and then we waited and waited and waited. And then I finally asked him, you know, what's the holdup? And then they said, the computer says they've got all this information in here already. And I said, what do you mean? Okay, the last name and birth date. Is all this correct? You know, the color of his eyes and height and weight and everything. And he said, it's all in here. And I said, we're twins. But even though we're twins, we're different. Um, the spiritual writers say that God created each angel. You know, there's, there's billions of angels, but each angel is a different species. And we know that snowflakes are unique creations of God, that each snowflake is different. So each soul is special to God, that we can know, love, and serve God. We can glorify him in a way that no one else can. God created each one of us uniquely different. No two human beings are completely like, even twins. Um, Father Stephen Brown writes, He made each separate soul as if there were no other. Fundamentally, all are alike, since all have human nature, but they have it differently. To each, God gave a personality of his or her own and a certain combination of qualities, characteristics, gifts, physical, intellectual, moral, such as he gave to no other. My dearly beloved in Christ, we should accept ourselves as a, as a gift from God's hand, not only with whatever qualities and talents we have received, but also with our limitations and shortcomings. The task of each one of us in this life is to cherish and develop as best we can the gifts God has given us. We can only accomplish this task if we live our life in accordance with his holy will. There are both advantages and handicaps which accompany us along our particular but separate course which God has mapped out for each one of us. Each one of us has our own particular difficulties, obstacles, helps and hindrances as we follow our path in life. We're also given and allowed a time to finish our work. My dearly beloved in Christ, the intention for all our actions should be to express our love of God. We then follow that we would want to totally obey him in order to please him. As our Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The soul that truly loves God will hence find contentment in the fact that he or she is, she is doing God's will and fulfilling their purpose in life. When we subject our will to God's, we lead a God-centered, not self-centered life. This not only leads us on the road to heaven, but also gives us a higher degree of peace and happiness here on earth because it imparts to our soul a peace which the world cannot give. Isaiah, using God's word, reproached the Jews for their obstinacy and spoke of the peace they had lost because of it. He said, All that you would have observed my commandments, your peace would have been as a river and your justice as the waves of the sea. My dearly beloved in Christ, the sister of St. Thomas Aquinas is asking, What does it take to be a saint? And he said two words. Will it? And then St. Ignatius expressed the same thing, and he said, conquer yourself. Our fallen nature and lower passions lead us to believe that we can enjoy peace and calm only when nothing opposes our will and when everything is done the way we want. The only way in which this would be possible is when we will exactly what God wills. In this way, there's no conflict or contention. We're happy because we're getting what we want, which in reality is what God wants. Every will that tries to oppose the will of God is bound to be overcome and broken. And instead of peace and happiness, its effort can only end in humiliation and bitterness. My dearly beloved in Christ, in the Holy Scripture, Job, knowing this, speaks of God by saying, He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted God and, and have had peace? The person whose will is perfectly united to God's because he only wills what God wills, no more or no less, has his own wishes always fulfilled 
and nothing can happen that he does not wish. This is what enables us to give thanks to God in all things. This does not mean, however, that we will not feel pain or sorrow along life's path. Such feelings affect us only in the lower part of our being, which fights against our will, making our determination to do God's will difficult. It cannot be denied that human nature finds the idea of suffering, humiliation, even poverty, almost incompatible with the idea of happiness. Hence, it's really a miracle of grace that we can be happy in such circumstances. God gives this miracle of grace to those who make the sacrifice by seeking His will in all things and who give themselves generally, generously to His service. At this point, some might argue that it's hard to determine what God's will is and how in a practical way we can practice conformity to it. But the answer is simple. To do the will of God, first and foremost, we need to faithfully keep and humbly obey God's commandments and those of His church. After that, we should will and accept as obedient children of God all that comes from his loving providence. And then lastly, that we're faithful to the sacrifices of our daily duty. We fulfill it faithfully. First, let's consider the natural incidents of our daily lives. This would include a lot of little vexations, such as a hurtful word, annoying insects, barking dogs, banging into something as we walk along, an accidental hurt, a light going out and not working, car problems, a pen that won't write, forgetting where you place something, the list goes on indefinitely. These are not the mountains we have to climb, but the annoying pebbles in our shoes. By accepting them for the love of God, we pre prepare ourselves for more serious difficulties. Also included is the changeableness of the weather, heat, cold, wind, storm, etc. How often do we complain about all of the above? Since we do not live in a perfect world, all these inconveniences are a result of the permissive will of God. Public calamities such as famine, pestilence, epidemics, earthquakes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, fires, hurricanes, etc., also are willed by God, always with the purpose of bringing good from evil and for the salvation of souls who otherwise would never turn to him. So with our crosses, we should fix what we can and then offer up everything else to God. We should, with God's help, with the help of his grace, we can carry our crosses patiently and bravely. And then next week we'll go into some others. Uh, when we succeed in perfectly conforming our will to the divine will and enabling ourselves thereby to accept all things as coming from the hand of God, then shall we be blessed, as blessed and as happy as it can be possibly in this world. We shall experience a joy and consolation that's known to few because such a joy and consolation is enjoyed only by those who are closely united to God. And I'd like to close with the story, and this is, has to do with Father John Toller. He ardently desired to make rapid progress in holiness. And for eight years, he prayed fervently and humbly that God would send him a spiritual director who would point out the shortest and safest way to God's love. One day, he heard an interior voice say, Go to the church door. There you will find a man who will show you the way of truth. Toller obeyed. He went to the church and, the f and at the door found a poor beggar, ragged and barefoot. Toller approached and wished him a good day. I thank you for your friendly salutation, answered the beggar, but I cannot remember having ever had a bad day. Good, exclaimed Toller. I hope for the good days you've, you've had, God may add every possible happiness. Thank you, replied the beggar, but I have never been unhappy in my whole life. No disaster has befallen me. And then he continued, Listen, Father, I told you that I've never had any bad day, for our days are bad only when we do not employ them in honoring God by submission. If I'm hungry because no one gives me anything to eat, I praise God. 
If I'm exposed to rain, hail, and wind, I thank God. If my poverty and wretchedness draw upon me contempt or have any other suffering to endure, I praise and bless the divine majesty. I have moreover told you that I have never been unhappy. You may express surprise, but what I say is true, for I'm accustomed to desire without reserve whatever God wills. Hence, I accept with joy all things, sweet or bitter, that come to me from his hand, and the conviction that they are what is best for me. And this constitutes my whole happiness. And if God should condemn you, replied Toller, should God will to condemn me, answered the beggar, I would embrace my Lord with humility and love, and I would cling so fast to him that should he wish to plunge me into hell, he would be obliged to go with me. It would be a greater pleasure for me to be with him in hell than without him to possess the beatitude of heaven. Where have you found God? asked Father Toller. I found him there where I've taken leave of creatures. Who then are you? (laughs) I am a king. Where is your kingdom? In my inmost heart where I preserve perfect order. My passions must obey God. Lastly, Toller inquired, what led him to so great perfection? The beggar answered, silence. I'm silent with men in order to converse with God. In him, I have always perfect peace. The poor beggar had attained perfection by his conformity to the will of God. And in his poverty, he was certainly richer than all the monarchs of earth and happier in his sufferings than worldlings with all their earthly pleasures. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.